Welcome to First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. I'm Jonathan Capehart, associate editor at the Washington Post. Tomorrow is the big day, the South Carolina Republican primary, and it could be make or break for the candidacy of the state's former governor, Nikki Haley, or so conventional wisdom says. Joining me now, Dylan Wells, campaign reporter for the Washington Post. Dylan, welcome to First Look. Thanks so much for having me. All right, you reported this week that Haley defiantly says she's staying in the race no matter what happens in South Carolina tomorrow, her home state. Is that is that the strategy or is that more campaign bluster to help uh, supporters stay on board? I was in Greenville earlier this week for her speech, which comes ahead of an expected loss here in the state tomorrow. It's a state where Nikki Haley was a popular governor and she has been receiving a lot of questions about her intentions to stay in the race. And so this speech really reflected what she has been saying on the campaign trail that she's in this for the long run, what her aides and allies have said about her plans to stay in the race and for Super Tuesday travel. But she acknowledged in that speech that she recognized that she was getting questions about her intents and her political future. But like you said, she said she is fully committed to be in this race after Saturday, after her expected loss here. Mm -hmm. And she framed herself as David fighting Goliath. And she amped up her criticism of former President Trump even more than she has in the recent weeks and really said that she was not concerned about retribution, didn't want to kiss the ring. And so as of right now, the campaign's plan truly is to stay in this race at least until Super Tuesday next week when we'll have all of those additional states weigh in. Um, how is her her message a, against Trump, her, her very um, strong, more pointed criticisms of the former president than at any time during her campaign, how are those, how are they landing in South Carolina? It, how are, how's the audience reacting to those, to those zingers on Trump? I've been following Nikki Haley for a year, and it's been really fascinating to see her transition. She has started questioning his mental competency. She's accused him of palling around with dictators, criticized him for, you know, talking to Vladimir Putin, for criticizing her husband. It's just at a whole new tenor. And at her events, those comments are going over very well. There are always applause lines in her speech. A lot of the people I talk to in attendance say that they want to move past Trump or that they have similar beliefs about him, but it's what's going on beyond her events and those people who are not attending um, where those are really controversial. This is a state that has become Trumpier over the years since she was governor. And so those types of criticism of the former president don't play well in general with the broader Republican base. So then when you're talking to people at various events there in South Carolina, what are you hearing from them in terms of the the uh, issues that are important to them? In terms of policy, I think when I talk to voters here, the top priority tends to be either the economy or concerns around the border and immigration. But what's interesting for a lot of Haley events is when you ask people kind of why they're there for her, why not Trump, why not Biden? Um, a lot of the answers have to do with the age of the two front runners in this race on either side of the aisle. A lot of people think that Trump just isn't necessarily with it anymore and they don't like the controversy that he brings. And some of the people at her events have been more moderate Democrats or independents who said that they backed Biden in the past, but now they're concerned about him primarily due to his age. Hmm. I'm, I'm scribbling a note here because I'm just uh, writing, is there any sense that Democrats and independents uh, will will vote for her because Democrats who did not vote in the Democratic the Democratic primary in South Carolina a few a couple of weeks ago, they would be eligible to vote. Yeah, that's tomorrow. <laughs> would be able to vote tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an interesting dynamic at play here in South Carolina with the primary rules. Haley has made a few kind of appeals um, softly in that direction. You know, mentioning at her events that anyone can participate not just Republicans provided they didn't vote earlier this month. And the super PAC backing her has put out some materials with similar language. And then there's been kind of a ragtag movement on the ground of some groups to try to get 
independents and Democrats to turn out for her. There's one group in particular that's been sending text messages and holding some events trying to appeal to Democrats who might, you know, back Biden in the general election in November, but trying to convince them to vote for Haley in the Republican primary with their pitch being a choice between Nikki Haley and Joe Biden is better than a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. So I got to I have to ask you about a, a little bit of controversy that uh, Nikki Haley got into after the Alabama ruling um, that mm -hmm. said embryos are people. Um, she she voiced agreement with the Alabama Supreme Court ruling um, by telling uh, NBC's Ali Vitale that, yeah, yeah, she does think that embryos are people. Two questions. One, on the campaign trail, how did that go over? assuming that anyone cared <laughs> that, that it was as big a controversy uh, and and two the impact of that comment on her campaign broadly speaking yeah, so Haley said that she believes that embryos are babies but then she later kind of tried to walk back part of that statement and said that she wasn't necessarily saying that she agrees with the stance of the Alabama ruling so it was really reminiscent for me of how she's talked about abortion on the campaign trail, which is a way that her allies and supporters say has garnered her further support because she's framing herself as a consensus builder, but her critics say is her trying to have it both ways or be wishy-washy on what her exact position is. Um, so this really reminded me of that and not necessarily saying the specifics of where she stands on the ruling, but kind of offering a glimpse into how she is talking about this. I think it's really interesting because her stance on abortion, where she has centered, you know, talking about finding consensus and not said as many policy specifics, has allowed her to build some support with, you know, voters who believe in the right to abortion who wouldn't otherwise support her. So her weighing in on this Alabama ruling in whatever sense that she did that did give more fire to the Democrats in particular, who have been saying that she's just like Trump, she's MAGA as well, that she would restrict the right to abortion. And for those voters who are Democratic leaning, who might be supporting her, particularly who are more pro-choice, um, it kind of goes against some of the, how they're thinking about her stance on abortion otherwise. All right, let's talk about somebody else, and that's Senator Tim Scott. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering, I mean, Donald Trump is so far ahead in the polls. I'm wondering two things. Um, is Tim Scott, Tim Scott also ran, dropped out of the race and endorsed Donald Trump. So my two part question is one, well, it's the same question. Who benefits more from Tim Scott's endorsement of Donald Trump? Does Donald Trump really need Tim Scott's endorsement to help him win the state or is Tim Scott's endorsement a way of saying, hey, look at me, I, I want to be vice president? I mean, given Trump's lead here, I don't think that Tim Scott's endorsement is going to be necessarily make it or break it by any means for the former president. But Scott has been a key surrogate for him in the state. He's been at pretty much every Trump event that we've seen here ahead of the primary. He has been going out to events on Trump's behalf and really putting in some of the effort showing that he is here for Donald Trump. And so I think that that will be really interesting to see with the vice presidential speculation because Trump has been praising him a lot here in South Carolina. And I'm curious how that continues going forward after Saturday's primary. And I can tell you that the Haley camp took Tim Scott's endorsement very personally. Um, you might remember Nikki Haley appointed Tim Scott to the Senate back in the day. Um, Actually, Nikki Haley's son, Naylan, has been introducing her on the trail, and in one of those introductions referred to Senator Scott as Senator Judas, which I think gives you a, a sense of their thinking about that endorsement. Ooh, it's gotten downright biblical in the South Carolina <laughs> Republican primary. Dylan Wells, um, I don't think we've ever met. Nice to meet you, Dylan Wells. Campaign Great reporter to meet the, you. <laughs> <laughs> campaign reporter for The Washington Post. Thank you very much for coming to First Look. Have a good weekend. Thanks for having me. Time for the Opinions Roundtable. So let's go to the opinion side of the Washington Post where we will find Washington Post columnists Max Boot 
and Jennifer Rubin. Max, Jennifer, welcome back to First Look. Great to be here. So let's get to the breaking news that is that is hitting as we speak. The Biden administration announcing more than 500 sanctions against Russia in response to the um, unexpected death of Alexei Navalny in a in a Siberian prison. Um, um, a lot of the sanctions are meant to constrict uh, Russia's energy revenue. But Max, I would love for both to get reactions from both of you. But Max, your reaction. Um, to these sanctions, could the administration be doing more? And should the administration have already imposed these sanctions on the energy sector, considering Russia's, what, 363 days away from being two years into its invasion of Ukraine? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth, uh, Jonathan. I was going to say, like, why are we imposing these sanctions now instead of two years ago? Why wait? I don't think these sanctions are going to have a significant impact on Russia because Putin has basically learned to live with sanctions and the Russian economy continues to function principally because Russia is able to sell a lot of its oil to uh, first to China, second to India, third to Turkey. And unless those countries cooperate in cracking down on Russian oil sales, which they're not going to do, the sanctions will not have a significant impact. There are things that we can do that I think would have a significant impact. For example, there is $300 billion in frozen Russian funds in the West, which we could send to Ukraine tomorrow. That would be a massive boost to Ukraine and a massive blow to uh, Vladimir Putin. And of course, there is the uh, $60 billion Ukrainian aid bill, which is stuck in the House. And obviously, both of those things are beyond Joe Biden's power to do on his own. For the $300 billion, he needs the help of our European allies. For the $60 billion, he needs the cooperation of the House. But those are the significant things we really desperately need to do to strike a blow against Putin and his regime. These sanctions are not going to do it. They're, they're, they're symbolism, but they're not going to be all that significant. Jennifer, your, your, your reaction. Well, I certainly agree with Max, and that $300 billion uh, in uh, frozen assets is really uh, a point of contention. Uh, the administration keeps saying that they need authorization from Congress. Um, they don't have the unilateral power to do that. Uh, there are a number of constitutional scholars who say that simply isn't the case. Now, the bigger problem is that many of those assets um, are not in U.S. banks and U.S. Uh, on U.S. soil. So we do need the help of our allies, and um, one would hope that that pressure is continuing. Now, I can also imagine the allies saying, well, we'll go along with this, but where is your aid for Ukraine? And they've got a point, um, and that comes back to the Congress. Now, uh, just in the last day or so, um, uh, we learned that the Democrats in the House are planning on getting a discharge petition going um, uh, as of March 1, I believe. Um, and that would finally, we hope, um, spring the aid bill from the clutches of the MAGA Republicans, get that on the floor, get a vote. Hopefully, it will match up with the Senate, and we'll finally get that aid. But Ukraine is in a very, very bad way, and either lawmakers don't appreciate it or they simply don't care. Um, they are running low on uh, just ordinary um, ammunition. So they have to, if you can believe it, people in the front have to regulate the number of um, missiles they can shoot, the number of bullets they can shoot every day. That's how bad it is. And this is an absolute disgrace for the West and for the Republicans in Congress. If we let them down, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of this heroic fight. This is our fight against tyranny, our fight uh, for the uh, sanctity and the security mm -hmm. of the West. And we are letting them down. Um, my math was wrong. It's 364 days because there's 365 days in a year and tomorrow will be two years um, since Russia invaded Ukraine. There's other breaking news that we woke up to even earlier than the news of the sanctions, Max, and that is Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, who doesn't travel all that much, but he arrived in Ukraine this morning with a delegation of, I think, about three or four other senators in tow. Um, according to the reports, he's there to 
talk to, to meet with President Zelensky, and then come back to Washington with the message about how bad things are in Ukraine and why U.S. support is desperately needed and why the bill Jennifer was just talking about and you were just talking about um, must be passed. I'm just wondering, will Leader Schumer's undertaking of this, of a dangerous trip to a war zone, will that have any impact on the MAGA Republicans who are standing in the way of anything going to Ukraine? Probably not. I mean, I'm glad Chuck Schumer is there. I think that's what responsible American leaders ought to be doing, which is to showing solidarity with the Ukrainians in, the, in their resistance after more than two years to this unprovoked Russian aggression. What really struck me, Jonathan, when I was, I was actually in Ukraine a few weeks ago myself, and what struck me and, and, and kind of came at me, it was just such a moving experience to be with the Ukrainians and to see how resolute they are, even despite the suffering that has been inflicted on them by, by Putin and his, and his military, and how they continue to stay on strong, uh, despite the attacks on civilians, the horrendous atrocities the Russians have carried out and so forth. What really struck me is, where is Mike Johnson? Mike Johnson is the House Speaker. He holds the future of Ukraine in his hands. The course of this war is not going to be determined on the battlefield in Ukraine. It's going to be determined in the House of Representatives in Washington. And Mike Johnson has more power than anybody else to determine what goes to the floor, what gets passed, what doesn't. And right now he's blocking the aid bill that Ukraine desperately needs. As Jen Rubens mentioned, they are running low on ammunition. Uh, and, and they've just lost Avdivko, another city that fell to the Russian onslaught because the Russians were firing you know, 10 to 15 artillery shells for every one that the Ukrainians had. So my question is, it's great that Chuck Schumer is there, because, but we know he's already a supporter of Ukraine and he passed the bill in the, in the Senate. But where is Mike Johnson? Doesn't Mike Johnson want to go to Ukraine? He's never been there. He should at least have the decency if he's going to tell the Ukrainians that he doesn't care what happens to them, if he is going to allow the Russians to conquer and destroy Ukraine. He should have at least the decency, the guts, to look Ukrainians in the eye and say, screw you, I don't care what happens to you. But he doesn't. He's a coward. He's staying in Washington. He doesn't have the guts to go to Ukraine and see for himself why our aid is so desperately needed. It's heartbreaking. You know, Max, I hear, and we all, I hear, and we all hear and see the passion in, in, in that response. And it is just, it's mind boggling to me uh, to echo your point that the Speaker of the House um, is doing what he's doing. And you raise a key question. Where is Mike Johnson? And we know where he was on President's, President's Day because he put out a, a, a tweet or whatever of a picture of him uh, of himself with Donald Trump. And so, Jen, I am wondering, is the reason why Speaker Johnson isn't doing anything on Ukraine, isn't even bothering to go to Ukraine, because the real Speaker of the House is telling him not to. I think that's absolutely right. Um, Mike Johnson, from <clears throat> all I hear, both from Republicans and Democrats, usually off the record, he's weak, he's confused, he has no plan, he is in over his head, uh, and all he does is try to stay out of the firing zone of the MAGA Republicans and Donald Trump. So he does these st stunts. He mouths off at a Republican retreat, um, giving them a Christian sermon rather than addressing the issues before them. He is a pathologically weak, inept figure. And that Republicans would go to him because he is weak, because he can be manipulated, speaks volumes about where the Republican Party is. Remember, this happens at a time that the House Republicans impeachment scheme has once again been revealed to be based upon the testimony of someone, a Russian, who consorted with Russian intelligence. If the Russians paid Republicans to assist them. They would not be doing anything differently than they are now. They are doing everything in their power to enable Donald Trump to subvert this president who has been strong on Ukraine to come up with this cock and bull impeachment story, which has now been thoroughly discredited. They are not pursuing aid. I think 
one factor and one story that perhaps deserves much more coverage is why is the Republican Party essentially now an adjunct of the Kremlin? And that's not an exaggeration. They are pursuing a political course to disrupt and remove, um, presumably, President Biden from office because he is an adversary of Russia. They are holding up aid to Ukraine because that's what Vladimir Putin wants. And we have a, a party that is not only in the sway of Donald Trump, but is really acting as an agent of a foreign country. This is a disgrace. This is an outrage. This has never happened in the history of the United States. And yet, and this is called a, a transition, and yet Donald Trump tomorrow is expected to win the South Carolina primary. Um, there is a poll, I had it on another sheet. Yes, there's the USA Today Suffolk University poll that has Trump leading Nikki Haley 63 to 35. There was another poll that I can't find that I read this morning that has Trump up also by, by 30 points. Um, if Trump wins, Max, I'll go to you with this. If Trump wins the South Carolina primary tomorrow, what should Nikki Haley do? She says she's she's staying in through Super Tuesday, but should she? Well, I think she should to make the case to Republican voters about why they're making the wrong choice. And I think, you know, there will be a moment of truth for Nikki Haley. As she has really come out very strong against Trump in the last few weeks, making a case against him that she did not make prior about how unfit he is, how disgraceful it is that he kowtows to Putin, refuses to criticize the murder of Alexei Navalny, and so forth and so on. So at the end of this process, is she actually going to turn around and endorse Trump? Or is she going to stick to her principles and continue battling Trump to let voters, both in the Republican Party and the general electorate, know that this is not a person who is fit uh, to be president? And I, I, I don't know what she's going to do. Uh, but I would think that the logic of her recent statements denouncing Trump in very strong and accurate terms should lead her not to endorse Trump and should lead her to stay on the race to continue making the case and, 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 and maybe get greater receptivity in states unlike her own, South Carolina, where uh, there might be fewer MAGA Republicans. Max, let me stick with you because you're writing a book about President Ronald Reagan. Uh, it'll be out later this year. And I'm just wondering, how might Ronald Reagan uh, regard the current Republican Party? Would he even recognize it? This is not Ronald Reagan's party. I mean, I, as many people have said, I think Ronald Reagan would be spinning in his grave because, you know, so much of his presidency was devoted to battling what he called the evil empire and backing, you know, anti-leftist uh, movements or or backing. Uh, guerrilla fighters who are battling the Red Army in, in Afghanistan or battling Soviet-supported regimes in Angola or Nicaragua or what have you. So it would have been, I think, inconceivable to him to see a Republican president or a former Republican president basically saying that we should let uh, you know Moscow do whatever the hell they want to do and, and, and attack as many of our allies and, and friends as, as they would like. I, I, I think this would be like a mind-boggling transformation, but clearly this is not Reagan's party anymore. This is Trump's party. And, you know, to the point that, that Jen Rubin was making earlier, it occurred to me when you, when you look at the dramatic transformation and Republican attitudes towards Russia and towards NATO, uh, it occurs to me that, you know, Putin's intervention in our 2016 election was probably one of the most successful covert operations of all time because he helped to elect Donald Trump. And that continues to pay dividends to the present day where I don't think he would have had these dramatic changes in sentiment in the Republican Party if it were not for Donald Trump. It might still be a more Reaganite party, but it's not. And, and so I think utterly unrecognizable from what it was in the 1980s. And so then, Jennifer, the, the question is, how did, and maybe Max just answered it, but how did the party of Reagan become the party of Trump so quickly? Well, that is really the $64,000 question. 
There are a lot of explanations. Um, I think the one that makes the most sense and that is supported by a great deal of um, polling data and other research by people who look at white Christian nationalists is that there was a white freak out in this country um, as white Christians, um, Protestants, that is, became a minority, um, they freaked out. They think they should be in charge of this country. They think that Christianity, not the Constitution, should be our guiding principles. That's what we heard from that judge in Alabama who invalidated uh, IVF, which is used by thousands and thousands of couples to conceive children. Uh, this party gave itself up to an ideology that essentially is totalitarian, anti-democratic, uh, isolationist, and people like that seek others who are nationalistic, who are tyrannical, who disregard human rights. They glob on to other dictatorial figures. So Donald Trump's idol is Vladimir Putin. It's people like that that he wants to be like, if you think about it. Remember, this is a man who killed his primary dissident opponent, Alexei Navalny, who killed another dissident in Spain this week, mm -hmm. who invaded an, another country and committed atrocities. That's the idol for this party. So I think the very long answer to your very simple but not simplistic question is when they decided they wanted to go down the route of white Christian tyranny, they took on all of the baggage that goes with that, including an affinity for anti-American dictators. And Max, I'm going to give you the, the last word on this. Um, in listening to bo both your answers, I come back to a question I keep asking um, various people at various points, particularly on my show on MSNBC, and that is, have the American people given up on democracy? And I ask that question because about half the country likes Donald Trump. They like his authoritarian um, ways, the things that he that he's saying. There's a reason why he is romping to his third consecutive Republican presidential nomination. Um, I'm, weren't the, aren't the American people primed for this, or weren't they primed for this very successful Russian operation in 2016? Um, and that's why we're here right now. Those are great questions and great points, Jonathan, and I share your, your anguish and dismay. I mean, I really can't believe how many Americans are showing that they don't care the slightest about preserving our democracy and they're willing to elect somebody who is facing 91 felony counts, who's already been impeached twice, who's promising to be a dictator for a day, who's promising basically to, to uh, 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 wreak vengeance on his political enemies, who's promising to Mass, my, mass roundups of uh, undocumented immigrants who's promising to abandon NATO, all these things that have been, you know, kind of the bulwarks of the, of the American democratic order for decades. He's promising to tear them down. And a lot of voters are applauding, quite literally so. Uh, it, it is very dismaying. And I think what we're seeing is that for a lot of people, they're not really concerned about preserving democracy. They would much rather have their own policy preferences enacted into law in, in the way that Jen Rubin just discussed. And of course, there are a lot of alienated folks in this country uh, who think we're going in the wrong direction and who are very primed for a dictator who will give them what they want. That's, you know, this is the kind of thing that we always thought could only happen somewhere else. It couldn't possibly happen in America, but it is happening in America right now. And we have, you know, only a few months, we only have this year to, to save our democracy. I really believe this is an existential election. You know, I'm continuing my trend of not being able to count. Jen, we actually have literally one minute, so I will um, get your thoughts. You know, Don, Ronald Reagan had a great expression that I didn't fully appreciate, uh, Maxwell, uh, like this, which is we're always one election away from losing our freedom. And that is absolutely correct. If we elect Donald Trump and his enablers in Congress, they will proceed to dismantle um, in a day, in a week, in a month, um, what we consider to be American democracy. And it is also true that democracy is not a static thing. Um, it is a act of being. It is a mandate for all of us to get in there and fight for our democracy. We used to take it for granted that whoever won, well, American democracy would go on. That is not the case. And um, the outcome of this election is 
going to depend upon other Americans who believe in democracy, who believe in a decent, humane society, who do not want their lives run um, by Christian nationalists um, who tell them when to have children, when they can't have children, what they can read, what they can't read, what they can learn. Um, it's going to be those Americans um, who determine the fate of this country. And it, it really is all up for grabs this year. Jennifer Rubin, Max Boot, this has been an incredible and important conversation. Thank you both very much for coming back to First Look. Have a good weekend. You too. You too, Jonathan. For more of these important and interesting conversations, sign up for our Washington Post subscription. Get a free trial by visiting wapo.st backslash live, W-A-P-O dot S-T backslash live. Also, today marks 331 days that Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich has been wrongly imprisoned in Russia. His crime, journalism. I'm Jonathan Capehart. Thank you for watching Washington Post Live's First Look.